and the Bikini Car Wash Company, everybody. Scott's going to be with us all show. Uh, let's just get this right out of the way up top. You brought a little sample board, right? I don't know. Did I? So that'll be a lot of fun. We have a lot of show to get to, so let's just get right to it. Welcome, everybody, to the first live Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin show. I don't know if you guys have listened to much of the podcast, and it's difficult for me sometimes to articulate exactly what the podcast is about, because mostly it's uh, just me doing whatever I want to. I'm just talking about what I want to, uh, to who I want to talk to it about. Uh, we talk for as long as we want to. So today, and I didn't even realize what I was doing until everyone was here and it was all set up. I've kind of set up my own dream game show for myself to participate in. I'm going to be both the host and a contestant. And my dream game show is arguing about video games, which we are going to be doing. Sorry if you didn't know that. Uh, we are going to be doing through this game called The Meta Game. And this is a real game. You can buy it in stores, and it's great. And we did it once before on the podcast. And the way it works is that there are two types of cards in the metagame. Uh, there are game cards like these, and these all have the name of a game on it. Like this one is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Uh, this one is Words with Friends. And uh, it's a really interesting cross-section of game. They didn't just like take the top 100 games and put them on cards. There's some thought in them. There's mobile games, there's retro games, there's newer stuff. And then the other type of card over here, I'm almost done guys, I swear, and then we're gonna have fun. The other uh, type of card is a question card. And again, these aren't just like, which has the sweetest graphics. They're interesting questions. Like this one is, which is a better way to spend 10 years? Uh, this one is, which is simply a better game? So uh, we're gonna bring out some contestants. It's gonna be me and two other contestants. And every round, we are going to flip over a new question card. And everyone will have a hand of five game cards. And they will have to decide which game card best answers that question and then explain why. And each round, we're going to have a new guest judge come out. They're going to decide who is right. If, uh, what else? Each round is worth a point. Whoever has the most points at the end wins. The last round is the bonus round, which is worth two points. Uh, whoever has the most points at the end of the game will have $100 donated to the charity of their choice. And, uh, you know, we did this once before on the podcast, but now we are actually playing with the metagame expansion pack. And what that does is it adds more games, there are more questions, and it justifies a sequel. So, I think that's everything. Without further ado, let's bring out the other contestants. Please give it up for Jared Logan and Adam Conover. Yeah, let's, let's see. Both of whom brought beer. Getting, I get one up on them already, because I'll be sober. Uh, guys, I thought this would be uh, a fun little... Me i got to put this mic back. This would be a fun little meta, meta game to play as we went along. Is, uh, as everyone comes out, we're going to find out. Just, you know, take their temperature, find out what's their favorite video game of all time. What's your favorite video game of all time? So, Jared, let's start with you. What's your, what's your favorite video game? My name is Jared Logan, and my favorite video game of all time is Shaq Fu. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah, that's a good answer. Uh, and my name is Adam Conover, um, and my... I'd have to say, I thought about it a bit, I think my favorite game of all time is Half-Life 2, if I can in include episodes 2 and 3, of Half-Life 2. I, he can't, can he? Ah. Uh, no. no. Well, episode 3, first of all, I don't mean to start this out bad, but episode 3 is not out yet. It is. Oh! You mean episode 1 and 2, maybe? That's what I meant, yeah. The two no. the two mini-sequels, yeah. Jesus. Well, it's they were oddly <laughs> named Half-Life 2, and then the sequel is called Half-Life 2 Episode 1. That's confusing. And I don't want to, you know, drag up ancient history, but I believe last time we did this, Adam, you uh, made the mistake of not... I don't know, you didn't know which one Alex was in. You didn't know something about Half-Life. I made a major, I claimed that Half-Life 2 had no good non-player characters when Half-Life 2 has famously good non-player characters. It's going to be an hour of this, folks. Buckle up. <laughs> Boy, was there egg on his face. Oh, man. You guys can imagine how embarrassing that was. 
It's an easy mistake to make. <laughs> This is going to be a tough crowd for very esoteric <laughs> video game discussion. We're, we're literally going to be talking and making jokes about like video game design process. Uh, well, let's just get right to it. Some people are like, fuck, can we, is there no way to get out of this room? <laughs> uh, round one, let's get started. Round one, our judge for round one, already on the stage. Everyone, one more round of applause for Scott Wiener. <laughs> I know, I know most of you. And Scott, what, what is your favorite video game of all time? Um, well, you know I don't really like video games. I know, but you so. know I told you I was going to ask this question before you got on stage. I know, so I, was, I was hoping I, you have something prepared. I think I emailed you. That, so I was in between Pilot Wings and Goldeneye, because that's like the last video games I remember playing. So I'm going to stick with Goldeneye. So this is an interesting note. Not all of the judges are intimately familiar with video games. Like, they can't all name the Battletoads. So we're going to have to, like... You, know. you mean zits. <laughs> but it's okay because isn't the winner is who makes the better argument. Yeah, we're going to have so to all... So in some ways, I'm the ultimate judge. Exactly, exactly. So are you guys ready to play? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's flip over. Jared, you're closest to the cards. Would you... Oh, wait, wait. Do you want to cut the deck first? I felt like that might be dramatic. Yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> let's have a very dramatic cutting. The audience gasped. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's flip over the first question. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, let's flip over the first You're question. The host. Go ahead. All right, here we go. The question is, which is more ridiculous? Which is more ridiculous? And we're all going to look at our hands for the first time. This will be a few awkward silence uh, seconds here. Choice made. Hmm. OK. Mm. Oh, man. I wish I had more time to think, but I'm on stage. I'm talking into a mic. All right. I'm going to go with this one. Do you got yours? Yeah. Uh, now, I believe last time we did it with the person who chose first got to go first, right? Do, we, do you guys want to stick with that? This yeah, okay. kind of thing we should have worked out before we started, huh? Yeah. Uh, do you want to go first, Adam? Yeah, sure. Should Adam? I stand up? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Adam, what game have you chosen? I chose as most ridiculous NBA Jam. <laughs> Uh, because as we all know, NBA Jam is a game whose premise is that it's ridiculous basketball. That's the whole point of NBA Jam. Uh, NBA Jam is a game where the announcer yells, he's on fire, and you literally catch on fire as you jump and uh, dunk the basketball. Um, it, uh, it's, it's cartoony, it's a big cartoony game. It's a game that uh, specifically throws the normal rules of basketball out the window in favor of being more ridiculous. It also created a whole series of ridiculous games like NFL Blitz, which was a football game where the best feature was you could keep tackling play people after the play was over. <laughs> Uh, that is the ridiculousness of the NBA Jam uh, franchise as a whole, and I would say it was in fact the first truly ridiculous sports game uh, for any console, and that is why NBA Jam is the most ridiculous game. Thank you. I want you to know this is polite applause. This is only polite applause I'm giving you right now. Am I next? Uh, yes. I'll go. I'll go. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott, I have chosen Mortal Kombat uh, as the most ridiculous game in my hand, and probably one of the most ridiculous games of all time. Mortal Kombat is such a ridiculous game that they had to get Congress together to argue about it. <laughs> NBA Jam's crazy, but like, Joe Lieberman wasn't worked up about it. Mortal Kombat uh, is a game that really like broke through barriers. It turned it on in a way that it had never been done before. There had been violent games and there had been blood in games, but no one had taken that blood and turned it into an art like Mortal Kombat. And it never really bothered me, the violence never bothered me, because the whole thing has this insanely ridiculous tone where it's not realistic, you know? It's not like uh, Call of Duty or um, what else? I don't know, even maybe even Street Fighter. Like, it takes place in this insane, even though the people are real people and the people in Street Fighter are cartoons, it takes place in this insanely ridiculous cartoon world where uh, Johnny Cage, who by the way is based on John, do you know that was supposed to be Van Damme? Johnny Cage was, they wanted Van Damme to play, because you know they have real people in Mortal Kombat and they wanted to get Van Damme to be Johnny Cage. Well, that would have been ridiculous. But... <laughs> But it 
turns out it was less ridiculous than it could have been. But he's yeah, he should have done it, yeah. But he's basically Johnny Cage is basically based on Van Damme. John Van Damme is a character essentially in this video game who does splits and punches people in the balls. And here's how ridiculous Mortal Kombat is. They were testing it at some point. They were like, you know, if he punches Sonya Blade in the balls, that's not going to work. That had to be programmed into the game. It was one of the first games with Easter eggs. There's like a guy in the middle of all this violent fighting. There's a guy who just pops up in the corner every now and then and yells, Toasty! That's a thing in this game! Um, and then, you know, Mortal Kombat just went even crazier than that as time went on. This is a series that introduced uh, fatalities. We all know what those are. But then they also had babalities, where you can turn the characters into babies. There were friendship fatalities, where you would just do something nice for them. It was a game with a, a real wicked sense of humor, and that's why I believe it's the most ridiculous video game of all time. Thank you. Garrett? Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, I submit to you, is a game ridiculous if it's trying to be ridiculous, or is it just corny, like NBA Jam? <laughs> or Mortal Kombat, whose attempts at humor seem like that they were made by video game designers? <laughs> Not funny. A game is more ridiculous if it is accidentally ridiculous. That's why my vote for most ridiculous is Oregon Trail. <laughs> a game that attempts to teach kids about history, but instead lets children playing the game name their kids asshole, <laughs> shitty, poopy pants, big dick, and then allows children to just hunt while everyone in their family dies. <laughs> There is nothing more ridiculous than Oregon Trail, a game that not one child in America ever completed or ever learned from. Thank you. You know, some might say that's the kids being ridiculous and not the game. What do you think about that, Jared? I would not, I would, no. The game, is, the, the design flaws are built into the game. If it's a game for children, you've got to make, children, make sure children play the right way. I always... <laughs> we have to control our children! I think in retrospect, I, I didn't like Oregon... You know everyone like loves Oregon Trail, but I think in retrospect we can all acknowledge that it's not a very good game. We only liked it because the alternative was class. Yeah. <laughs> it was something totally. more fun than books in the library <laughs> for me. Scott, you have uh, heard the arguments? I have. What, do you, what are you thinking here? You know what? Really great. First of all, great arguments. All of them are great. There's no way they're going to be this good the whole time, so we should be excited <laughs> about this moment. I feel like, like, okay, so first of all, I'm just going to go point by point. Adam, great argument. You made eye contact with me. You made me feel special. <laughs> and I did like That's that. That's important. Yeah, I have good, I have good uh, rapport with the jury. People who listen to podcasts don't see the eye contact, but now they can hear it. So that was cool. I enjoyed that. I mean, Jeff, your argument is, I, it's funny, you didn't even have, I've heard you make that argument to like, <laughs> to like nobody before. Nobody was arguing with you. Yeah, you just I, said I basically set this whole thing up so someone will hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, I don't know, but Jared's argument was really good, really concise. You, you yelled a lot, which was good. I like that. But the only flaw was I felt like you were arguing for why the players of the game were more ridiculous than the game itself. I feel bad now. I feel like I brought that no, up. No, you didn't bring it up. Don't worry. I was thinking Objection. About it. Prejudicing the jury. No, I'm the host and a contestant, and I'm deciding this is legal. <laughs> this is a kangaroo court. <laughs> I'm <laughs> arguing that the game is more ridiculous because it's ridiculous by accident, not on purpose. Right, right. I understand that, but that's... I don't, okay, that's fine. But I feel like... I'm going to give it to Adam. Because I feel like that was wow. the better... Oh, shit! Of, and I'll explain why. Right. Fighting games, it makes sense to rip somebody's spine out of their body, but, you know, basketball games flying through the air, it was, it was more ridiculous based on it's neutral. You know what I mean? So Guys, I felt like you, you really pushed it. All First right. round, Adam. Uh, yeah, all right, thank you. I feel like I kind of pulled that one out. That was like, I, I thought I was an underdog after hearing these two excellent arguments. I gotta love with you guys. I don't think Mortal Kombat's that ridiculous. It's just the best answer I had in my hand. I really thought that I had won. <laughs> <laughs> you won the audience, but uh, 
All right. Well, that's all I care about. So we have now seen one round. Everyone knows what's going on. Let's do round two. Let's get our, oh, let's deal out one new card for everyone so everyone always has five cards in their hand. And let's bring out our judge for round two. She is the host of the Dork Forest podcast where they interview very funny comedians and celebrities about what they're dorky about. Uh, she's going to be on right after this show, so stick around and uh, check it out. Uh, please give it up for Jackie Cation. Jackie Cation, everybody. Jackie Cation. Hello. Wow. Jackie. First of all, let well, me just say, Scott, you're wrong. Oregon Trail. Okay. Well, now you have your chance, though. I now do. you you have now. your chance. But before we get started, we gotta ask, what is your favorite video game of all time? Uh, it depends what platform you're talking about and what decade. Uh, in the '80s, it was Donkey Kong, and then Joust, and then uh, there was the first hologram video game. I can't remember the name of. Time is it time? Yeah, the it was time, a time one travel. With yeah, yeah, that's it. Time? It was a terrible. The 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 the, the really bad game. didn't work. Yeah, really bad uh, game. But the dream. I love the dream. I love the, the ambition. Uh, in the 90s, it was, I believe, all Game Boy stuff, so Final Fantasy Legend 2 was the one uh, for the original Grey Brick, and uh, that was a good time. And then uh, in the and then Mortal Kombat, I went through the whole Mortal Kombat series, uh, very exciting, and uh, I, I own the first movie, not the second. And then uh, currently I am uh, playing the anti-Alzheimer's uh, Hidden, Hidden Chronicles games. Where you find shit that's buried in a picture. I'm 107. <laughs> so basically, this judge is the opposite of Scott. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm currently uh, in my late 90s. So uh, I might not be young. Uh, no. Let's uh, flip over cards, see what our round two question is. It is Which is more tragic? Which is more tragic? Let us consult our hands. Shadow of the Colossus. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Didn't really count for this part of the show. Did not figure out what we were going to do here. Scott, you want to lay a sound effect on me or something? I only have like four. I, already <laughs> I don't want to waste the other two that I have. They're really right. good. Right. I got one. Uh, I don't know who's first. I'll All right. Go first. Go. All right. Here is Adam. The most tragic game is Mist, the original Mist. One of my favorite games, uh, and here's why. A lot of games, when you lose the game, something bad will happen, right? Like someone will die, or uh, you know, people will, uh, like the country will be destroyed, the president will die. In Myst, Myst gives you a choice of three possible endings. Uh, two, or no matter which ending you choose, it involves consigning two people to be trapped for eternity in a tiny room inside of a book. And that's what you do in the game. The game literally, if you guys never got that far in Myst, because it didn't make any fucking sense. Uh, the puzzles were impossible. They got a lot better with the sequels. But um, like, it involved like uh, uh, putting pages back into books so you could like free these like these two brothers and a father who were trapped inside the books. And uh, no matter who you freed, the other two, uh, members of this family were consigned by the other one to be trapped inside of a book for like pretty much eternity, uh, which is like a very bleak ending. Even if the, you know, the, if you free one of the brothers, he traps you inside the book and then you see him rip pages out one by one laughing as your view go dark, goes dark, which is like a really chilling uh, image of being cast into hell by a video game, just like we're, you'll be imprisoned here forever. If you free the father, Atris, which is the goal of the game, he uh, he destroys the books that his sons are kept in because they let him down. That's the good ending of the game. <laughs> Is a, is a father imprisoning his children for eternity. That's the most tragic game. I'm just impressed Adam beat List. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, do you want to go next or should I? I can go. You want to go? We'll just yeah. mix up the order. Sure. Uh, I submit to everybody that the most tragic game, uh, at least in this round of the meta game, is Space War. What the fuck is that? You may be asking. <laughs> Space War was created in 1962. 
It was a video game that only guys that like worked at NASA played. <laughs> like Alan Turing played Space War, okay? Now why is that tragic? Well, I think it's kind of tragic because hundreds of people died to put science forward for millennia, struggling, pushing. I believe the Earth goes around the sun. You Fuck you, we're gonna burn you. The whole breadth of human knowledge pushed all the way into the 20th century to 1962 where we got space war and then we just stopped and said let's sit around and play Mario. <laughs> we fucking turned it into video games and then stopped. Where's my real space war? I want to be in space warring with people. Instead this is what we have. Fucking mist. <laughs> Who got ripped out of the book? I didn't get there yet, but I'm gonna spend 19 hours of next week finding out. That's tragic, ladies and gentlemen. My pick for most tragic game is Nintendogs. I'm holding up the card like, not only can you guys not see it, there's people listening on headphones, like on a treadmill on the subway. Imagine how little they can see it. Nintendogs is my pick for most tragic game. And it's not because it's like the number four selling game of all time. Like Nintendogs has sold more copies than every Zelda game combined. That alone would make it the most tragic game of all time. But I think what's so sad about Nintendogs is the idea of a child playing it instead of having an actual dog. Like there's some <laughs> legitimate <laughs> tragedy and sadness there that they they have love to give, and they're putting it into like a very glorified Tamagotchi. And I know the plot of Mist is very sad, it's very tragic, I couldn't follow it, but it sounds very sad. But uh, Nintendo X has no plot. The plot is that uh, you, are, you can't have a real dog. That's the plot of the game. And then like, instead you were given a Nintendo DS. And uh, as much as I love video games, nothing is more tragic than that. So, for, for two of you guys, if I can just say, the tragic thing was the existence of video games. <laughs> video games themselves well, make you sad. Jack's was a very personal tragedy. <laughs> and mine, and Jackie, keep in mind that mine was sort of an, uh, the tragedy of human existence. <laughs> Uh, Jackie, where'd you come down on this one? Well, first of all, I have to say, this is the best fucking game ever! Uh, I am having the time of my life. Uh, gentlemen, there is tragedy. There is tragedy in each and everything that you've said. It's true. Um, hey, I'm torn. I'm torn because the mist, that, that is the worst. That is the worst. And yet, the space, the space race is dead. <laughs> and it is dead for a reason, and it is dead because of Wario, uh, who is evil. And uh, um, and I always wanted a dog, and I was never allowed a dog. And they said, uh, I wanted to be blind so that I could have a dog when I was nine. <laughs> and my parents said, we still wouldn't get you a dog. We would get you a stick. And here's the thing, you could play with the stick. And here's the thing, uh, they might have gotten me a DS with Nintendogs. Uh, I, I gotta go mist, mist. Whoa. I know it, I know the injustice you guys are. Adam, jumping out to a 2-0-0 zero, zero lead. I feel like so far my arguments are like the least entertaining, but maybe just the <laughs> most logically sound. You're winning just because you know the most about the video game you're talking about. I thought Jared had it with that Turing reference. Yeah, I thought so it was over right. at that point. Uh, Jackie, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Our next guest judge is, ready for it? You! Yes, you have seen enough metagame at this point that you are qualified to judge a round. This round will be judged by a plausometer, which happens to be built into Scott. Woo! Scott's head just exploded. Scott's head just exploded. So, uh, if you have been paying attention to the show so far, now's the time to sit up, really focus, 
because uh, it's round three and you're in charge. So you guys ready? I think someone dealt that card while I was rambling. Yes. And let's flip over a card. Next round is about which game feels more like first love? <laughs> wow. Which game feels like oh, That is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my pick for game that is most like first love is Virtua Fighter. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> you had Virtua Fighter on the first love uh, round. <laughs> as you all know, Virtua Fighter has vibrant colors. Uh, uh, it was one of the first three-dimensional games. It was like, for the first time, the stuff had substance. You know what I mean? Like. It felt like it had weight and depth and substance because it was one of those first games that used like actual 3D modeling. And that's very much like when you first fell in love and you were like, oh, the world has taken on another dimension. <laughs> also, Virtual Fighter is a lot of like holds and like lips and like rolling around on the ground and uh, blood is spilled. So. And that way, Virtual Fighter is also like first love because someone is going to lose. And uh, I think we all know from our own experience that uh, the first love you ever have, uh, someone loses. And uh, there's usually a 30 second time limit for each round of the first love that you have. And that's why I think that Virtual Fighter is like first love. Thank you. I'm ready now. Do you want to? Uh, I'll go. I'll go. I'm gonna go. Getting a little loose up here. Getting a little loose. The game I have selected to <laughs> represent first love is 1980s Zork. Uh, Zork Ooh. is a game that is a text adventure. Uh, like if you ever saw a video game in an early 80s movie, this is what it looks like. Uh, there are no graphics. There is just text. You type. Uh, go north to go into the next room. You type pick up lamp when you need to pick up the lamp. Uh, very basic, very raw, and it's just like uh, you've never played a video game before in your life. These are some of the earliest uh, popular video games that were sold to a mass market. Uh, this is a tough question to answer. Uh, so how's it like love, Jeff? Well, it's... <laughs> you're in the dark a lot. Uh, you know, you, you might get eaten by a Gru. I, I basically picked it because Zork is like the first, uh, it's one of the first great video games. It's one of the, the first terrific video games. And uh, in that way, it's like first level. It's the first time anyone really got into a video game and got addicted to it. With all due respect to Pong, Pong's something you sat around in the basement and played. It was like a novelty. Zork was like a world that you got lost in. It's this whole adventure. Nothing had ever been done like it in video games before. And that is like falling in love in the first, for the first time, probably. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, folks, I'd like to tell you about a game, and that game is called Cave Story. Now, a lot of you might not have played this game. Uh, it's an independent release by a single Japanese programmer. He wrote it and he released it for free on the PC a couple of years ago, and that game is uh, the definition of the term labor of love uh, because this man spent, I forget his name, but he spent uh, four or five years just alone in his basement making a beautiful tribute to the games of his youth, to the games that he first fell in love with. Uh, it's a 2D uh, game that sort of looks like a classic a uh, Super Nintendo game, a 16-bit game, but he's put so much love into every single pixel of the game that where, you know, in, uh, earlier games would sort of repeat tiles, you know, to make a level. He just drew every tile individual. Every, every pixel was individually drawn. Uh, and uh, it, the, every level just has so much, like, love and care put into it. Um, that as a game you feel like, and I, I can't recommend it enough, it's free, go download it and play it. Um, like as, as a game you feel that you're moving through someone's love letter to a medium that they care so much about. It references other games, um, it, uh, it, it, it's a, it's, you know, it, it, there's, there's nothing uh, specifically like innovative or awesome about it, it is very fun, but like the amount of, what really stands out is the, the amount of heart in it. 
um, and it just gives you a warm feeling that you're sharing this man's experience of something that he cares so much about with him when you play it. And uh, that's why I think Cave Story is most like f first love. Thank you. I think uh, that was touching, by the way. I think that whoever wins this one, the other two people haven't been in love. <laughs> I think maybe based on this podcast, none of us have been in love. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's do some applause meter uh, Remember, this will be Scott uh, acting as applause meter If you guys thought Jared's choice was the most uh, my first love, give it to Jared. That was, a, that, was like a, that was like a hundred degree angle. That was pretty big. If you thought uh, my choice of Zork was the best choice for uh, first love. Give it up. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, and if you thought it was Adam, give it up for Adam. All right, I got to a few of you though, right? A few of you. I, I don't even know if I have to check the applause meter on this one, uh, but just, just to make it official, Scott, what do you think? At Jared. <laughs> Thank you guys, thank you, thanks. We, we haven't played in a while, so. <laughs> the score, Adam two, Jared one, Jeff zero. And we are moving into our next round. Uh, I don't think I have to do much introduction for our next, get, our next guest judge. He's been on this podcast more than anyone except for me. He is from College Humor and he's a super funny dude. Let's bring him out, everyone, Pat Castles. <laughs> Hello. And now we can all hear the answer to this very important question. Pat, what is your favorite video game of all time? Um, I was thinking about this backstage. I'm kind of split between um, Siphon Filter and Vector Man. Siphon Filter is not an answer I expected to get on stage. I Either is Vector Man. Vector Man's good. Vector Man's I good. don't know what those things are. It's a Sega game, and it's like very artistic. Oh, you're not on the show, Pat. <laughs> you're just here to judge. Uh, let's flip over to the next question. Let's get to it. Ready? Which deserves more respect than it gets? Okay. Out of love, back in a Jeff's wheelhouse. Okay, I got mine. Can I have five new cards? Uh, I don't know. We did that last time. What do you guys think? I'm the judge. Can I, don't I get to pick? Yeah, sure, Pat. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm I, this is cheating, by the way. All so. right, I, I also want to toss some out there. All right, you guys are set the rest of my cards. I'm gonna go first. I got the perfect one here that will win Pat over. My selection for, what's the question? Which deserves more respect than it gets? Is Rez. Rez from 2001 is an incredible video game. Uh, it is one of the first video games I ever played that really made me uh, think that video games could be art. It is, it looks, uh, it's the most stonerific thing that's ever been created in video games until the sequel, Project Eden. And, uh, but there's something to it, and it's a shooter, but uh, the way the shooting elements interact with the music, so that uh, the whole game, like, you're kind of playing music as you shoot things, uh, and it creates a very visceral experience. Very few games are uh, more captivating, more put you uh, into the game than Res. And in fact, uh, it's, and it's a game most people haven't heard of. It was a cult classic. And uh, I recently went to, to bring it back to Space War, there was a Space War exhibit at the uh, Museum of the Moving Image, and it was great, and they had a bunch of video games, and they had Rez at the museum. And I was so excited to see Rez, uh-oh, maybe, maybe it does get as much respect as it deserves if it's at the museum. <laughs> I, was like, I just cast myself into a corner. You're going to argue it. against yourself accidentally. <laughs> but it deserves even more respect than that. Where's the Siphon Filter exhibit? That's what I want to know. Because it is one of, uh, it's really one of the, one of the greatest uh, games of all time. It's one of the few Dreamcast games. It was on Dreamcast, poor game. That really broke through and made an impression. 
uh, on society, on gamers, and it should be a, a mainstream game. There should be a new one coming out every year, like, you know, like Madden series. Like, there should be Rezo 7, Rezo 8, Res 12, Res 13. Uh, and yet, most people haven't heard of it. So I am selecting Res. Um, I am selecting for a game that should get more respect than it should, one of the most popular games of the last few years, Fruit Ninja. Anybody like Fruit Ninja? Where are my Fruit Ninja people at? <laughs> no way. All right. Ninja. It's still one of the most popular games. <laughs> one of the most popular games. And people shit all over this game. Oh, I said no to some fat ass on the subway playing Fruit Ninja. That guy's never played a real game. That guy's never played Spelunky or Half-Life or Fez or whatever. But that guy is finding joy in that game of Fruit Ninja. The developers of Fruit Ninja have created an experience that is so tuned and tactilely enjoyable and playable that you just want to pick it up and you just want to play it some more. They've thought about, they're, they're, they're as good as game designers as any of those fucking effete art house wine drinking cheese snob games. They've thought about the design process. Don't you fucking condescend to the developers of Fruit Ninja. They know exactly what they're doing. And they've created a product that is so well crafted that millions of people around the world can't stop playing it. They, they'll buy expansions for Fruit Ninja. They'll pay an extra 99 cents just to get to carve up different fucking kinds of fruit because they want to see the fruit fall apart because it's so pleasant. Fruit Ninja is uh, an absolute uh, accomplishment and uh, it pisses me off when people condescend to casual games because those are the games that most people are playing. You know, those are the games that people uh, play. The it's like when people used to talk about shit about Minesweeper. Minesweeper's a great game. That's why everybody fucking plays it all the time. Yeah, I'm the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Conover, you've been warned about Minesweeper comments in the past. <laughs> Please refrain. Uh, if I, in conclusion, Fruit Ninja deserves more respect than it gets. I felt like I was watching like that scene from Network where like he's just going nuts. Like he's talking about Fruit Ninja. He's talking about Fruit Ninja. Cut him off. Cut him off. Hell, as hell. I want you to kick, take your fruit and throw it in the air. Uh, there were not. There were and there were nine sniper dots on your forehead as you were doing that. Open up your window. Throw your fruit out. Oh. Uh, I. All, all due respect to Mr. Conover, that was a an You're like a southern politician. Passion plea. Uh, my choice for a game that doesn't get the respect it deserves: Crayon Physics Deluxe. I chose this game, even though I took a mulligan to get all new cards, so I knew what games I was talking about. I have no idea what the fuck this game is. What is it? And yet, the creators of a game based around video games, who love video games so much, decided to include it, but I've never even heard of it. So it must be way better than I think it is. <laughs> I mean, they took that, they did, someone did art for it? Someone, there was an argument at the people that make Metagame, let's do Crayon Physics Deluxe, and everybody's like, no. And then the guy waited until they weren't in the office and he just made the card and put it in there because he cared about it so much. Yeah, it doesn't get the respect it deserves. Maybe it's because of the name, which sounds like a piece of shit name. Crayon Physics Deluxe doesn't sound like anything you'd ever want to play. But uh, I think that uh, definitely I should probably know what it is. And uh, after this podcast, I'm going to look into it. Pat, what do you think? Um, it's a tough call. Jeff, yours is very good. Uh, Dreamcast game is an interesting choice. Uh, I kind of, I thought Adam had it because I like the sort of populist decision there. I thought it was a cool direction to go. But I, th I think uh, Jared wins. I think that he sort of broke, <laughs> sort of deconstructed the game. Uh, as it's true. I've never heard of that well, game, I think. It was cheating to choose a game that he had no respect for. <laughs> no, but, but logically, it makes point. sense. Yeah, exactly. Like the fact by virtue of it being on in this game and none of us, I've never heard of it. Maybe. Oh, I've, I have a lot of I've respect heard of for Crayon Physics Deluxe. <laughs> it's a great game. Well, okay, hold on. Uh, it's all right. really fun. So that brings the score to 2-2-0. Two, two, and uh, Pat, thank you so much. One more time for Pat, everybody. 
And even though we are at 2-2-0, we have arrived at the bonus round, so I could still force a three-way tie Load where no one wins, no one gets any charity money in that situation. <laughs> so I want to get there. Uh, I'm about to bring up a surprise guest that Adam and Jared do not know about. Ooh. Please welcome John Sharp and Eric Zimmerman, two of the creators of the meta game. Oh! And we're going to have to get creative about mics down here. Oh, you guys are awesome. Now, guys, welcome to the show. Before we get to round five, I think we have some questions to ask, some, some stuff we want to find out. But first, the very first question we have to know, what is your favorite video game of all time? John, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, this is a, it's a hard one for a game designer, as you might imagine. And uh, when you first asked the question, I was thinking game. And so that was going to be basketball, but then... No, it has to be a video it game. It has to be a video game. So, nice try. You are a game designer. You like basketball better than video games? I do. What kind of game designer <laughs> are you? You're I'm, a I'm an embarrassment to my people, I know, I know. So I guess I would have to go with either Tempest, the arcade game from back in the 80s, or an iPhone game called Drop 7. Oh, Drop 7 is good. Oh, that game's fun. Uh, Eric, what about you? Um, I think I need to go old school on this one. Uh, maybe one of the most influential games for me growing up was, and I'm going to date myself here, Combat for the Atari 2600. Oh, I know there's a card for that somewhere <laughs> in the deck. <laughs> this, is, this is a game that, that is uh, not a single-player game. It's a multiplayer game you know, for one of the very first consoles ever made. And it, it's also a game where there's not just one game, but there's dozens and dozens. I think something like 112 different selections that you can make with the... Uh, uh, Various uh, keys on, on the front of the Atari 2600. So it's a it's a really uh, elegant, simple, fun design. That actually, I know there's a combat card in the game. Now I know it's your favorite game. So that actually gets to something that Jared just brought up with Crayon Physics Deluxe. How did you choose? And I addressed this in the introduction too. How did you choose what games made it in here? A lot of arguing. A lot of fun. There was like a meta meta game where you guys were arguing about what went in the yeah. meta game. Somewhere there's a spreadsheet with about a thousand games in it that we had to. Uh, fight our way down to 100. So it was not easy, but... Which game w did you fight about? The What's the biggest fight that didn't make it in the game? Well, I don't... It, I, we've had a lot of generations of games come and go to put out expansion sets and stuff. Do you remember one that we really fought over, John? Only in the Culture Edition. Uh, okay, well, I, I eventually we, we, we achieved a, a sort of a, a common consensus for the games, but... Um, it's, yeah, it's a, we, we tried to have a lot of games that were important historically. We tried to have a, a smattering of games that represent where games are going now and some more obscure games. And actually, John and I have been very impressed by the, the level of erudition uh, on display tonight. You guys are really uh, oh, geeking out you. here. Well, your, your game has enabled us to do that. I think it's, it's fair to say. Um, how did you come up with this game? Uh, the metagame has a long and convoluted history, but... It, it actually started as an insert for Wired Magazine that I created with Frank Lance, another game designer, which was never published. Um, that turned into um, a, a session at the Game Developers Conference, which we ran as a game show, a little bit like this. Um, and then that actually, MTV Online had a pilot game show version of the metagame many years ago. Um, but it really uh, kicked up uh, uh, momentum when I started working with John Sharp and Colleen Macklin, we did it as a massively multiplayer card game at the Game Developers Conference a couple years ago, which is the annual gathering for people that make games in San Francisco. And uh, about, uh, I guess about 3,000 people played the game, a version of the game where you're running up to people and challenging them. And if you won an argument, any bystanders would vote on the winner. You take a card from their hand and you're trying to collect the most cards by the end of the conference. That game was so popular that during the Game Developers Conference, we actually ran a Kickstarter campaign. This was just after Kickstarter had launched, so we were one of the first card game projects on Kickstarter, and that allowed us to publish this, the home version of, of the metagame. So we're, we're really happy that you guys are enjoying it. And John, I think you just alluded to this. There is, we're playing the video game edition of the, of the metagame, but there's actually a cultural edition too, which is movies, uh, art, plays, I don't know. I don't know anything about anything that's not video games, so I don't, I don't know exactly what's in there. 
Um, and I think it's interesting that you obviously could have made you know, a movies edition or a music edition, but you went right to video games. How, did, how was that decision made? I, mean, I think it, was, it had a lot to do with just the history of the metagame. It had always been a game about games, right? So we stayed with that. And then we were approached by a Sopus magazine, which is a local New York um, art periodical, uh, to do a project for them. And so we decided to extend it out to culture writ large. So it's film, music, dance, theater, comics, games, design, architecture, and fashion. I would be so much worse at that one. <laughs> I'd be so much worse. Tell me Cave Story is still in the other one. Uh, guys, you guys have any other questions before we play the last round? Who's playing properly um, among us? Who's well, doing... That, I, I, th one of the things I love about the metagame is that there's actually not a single right way to play. Oh, ah, thank God. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, the metagame, it's like a deck of cards, right? I mean, you buy it, and it's two stacks of cards, these cards with questions on it and a, and a, and a deck of game cards. When you buy the game, there's actually several different sets of rules. Some of them involve arguing. Some of them don't involve talking at all and sort of making strategic decisions. Some are for just a handful of people. Some are for huge groups of people to play. So what we love the most is when we see podcasts like yours, people inventing their own rules, finding their own ways to play the game. To us as game designers, that's the most exciting thing because when you make a game that is sort of open-ended, like the metagame, you really turn players into designers. And so for designers, that's sort of what warms our heart is when we see our players doing creative things that we're facilitating more than sort of telling them what to do each turn. But the short answer is Jared. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, Jared with a leg up as we head into this final round. You guys ready to flip over the question? Any other, any other questions before we get to the question? We're gonna change the rules here. Oh! Yeah, this is a surprise to me. Yeah, do we're that, doing. We're going to do judges' it. judges' choice, which is John and I are going to pick three questions. We're going to choose which one oh my you God. guys are going to answer. So we're going to curate um, this final round. Speaking of curation, you know, actually John was the curator of the Space War show at the Museum of Moving Image. Not sure. I actually knew that. Uh, <laughs> I did. I gotta admit, I did know that. But I didn't know that, and I was looking into who, cur who curated it, and I was like John Sharp, and I was like, why do I know that name? Because we'd already been in touch, and it was it was very exciting for me. All right, we need to deliberate for a moment. When you when you when you book and host a podcast, this is this is what it is all about. <laughs> yeah, this is this is as exciting as it gets. Crayon Physics Deluxe. How did that one make it in there? Crayon Physics Deluxe. I was actually uh, surprised to hear that that was in there. I didn't think it made it. <laughs> <there>. <laughs> it was in the um, original version we did at the Game Developers Conference because we tried to do a lot of insider baseball kind of games that people there would know. And, and I guess I forgot it actually made it into the published edition. I think it might have been one of the expansion ones. I think it might have been one of the expansion uh, ones. I'm not sure. All right. So Scott, Scott laying into that sound effect board. Now that we're running out of show. That was my last sound effect. So now I used them all. Awesome. All right. We got them there. all in there. All right. We have our question ready for our contestants. Okay. And the question is? Which is more sexist? Mmm. Wow. And, all right. Mm, okay. I like listening to Jeff think. <laughs> it sounds like... I guess I'm ready to go. I'll, I'll go. I am going to select... First of all, thank you, everyone. All our judges, all the contestants. We're having fun. Uh, for the final round, last ditch effort to get on the board today, <laughs> I have selected Gauntlet as the most sexist game. Uh, Gauntlet is a game... It's a four-player game, and each of the players uh, is a different race or a different class. Uh, there is, I, I believe, a barbarian, an elf thief, a mage, and then, like, a, um, I don't know what she is, but she's, like, the woman. And uh, on the cover, she's wearing, like, that classic, like, fantasy Boris Vallejo. I don't know if that's how you say his name, but, like, if you picture fantasy art, it's him. Uh, and like that armor that's really skimpy and just not at all even remotely functional armor. You know, it's, uh, it shows off more of her body than uh, it would actually protect her from dragons and ghouls and demons that she would find while she's playing Gauntlet. Very, very impractical decision. And Gauntlet, very early, very influential video game. And it kind of established and set up uh, that cliche of, you know, you have... Uh, all the dudes, and then you have the quick, fast, weak woman. 
Gauntlet was one of the first games that did that. It is a hugely influential game, and many games followed in its wake. Uh, and honestly, video games are still trying to wiggle their way out of it. So I think Gauntlet is the most sexist video game of all time. Thank you. Uh, I submit uh, to the judges and to the audience that uh, the most sexist game is Halo. Uh, Halo is almost the definition of a male game. Uh, just a game where a bunch of like older males sit around and think, what do younger males want to do in between jacking off and jacking off again? Uh, let's make a game for them. I believe... It's been a while since I played any of the Halo games. I never played the single player that much. But I believe the Halo series is set in a world with no women at all. It's just male soldiers killing male aliens. Uh, and it's also one of those games where uh, if, you, uh, if you play online and you talk to people, uh, young males will call you a faggot. Um, excuse me. Uh, they'll insult your masculinity at, uh, at every opportunity. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those super, super aggressive, super hostile environments. Um, it's, uh, you, it's, it's one of those things that uh, it d just like dwells and sits so much in this idea of like what men are into that it's, that it's frankly gross. It's just sort of sweaty. There's like testosterone all over it. I, it, it almost, uh, it, its presence almost offends me that it's like, this is what they think I would be into. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's one of those things. It's, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it doesn't Mountain Dew have an advertising campaign based around it. It's uh, some sexist shit. Thank you guys. Jared, with our final argument of the day. Adam, that's a bunch of horse shit because Halo does contain female marines. Space marines. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Adam. <laughs> Jeff, I don't remember what you said because I was busy <laughs> figuring out what card to use. I chose Dragon's Lair, which if you remember is a game from the early 80s that involved animation. You basically watched a cartoon, and then occasionally the cartoon would flash on the side of your screen, and you had to push the controller that way. But the story is about a knight rescuing a, I would say, voluptuous uh, animated young woman of the Jessica Rabbit type of form. And uh, the story is medieval in that way, that it is like very much, you know, man, knight, rescuing woman. But what really made it sexist for me was Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp, <laughs> the sequel spawned by this game, where at one point you're going through time and there's a fake scenario that you find yourself in. You find yourself in a world where you married the princess and she became obese and you have a lot of kids to take care of and she actually attacks you with a rolling pin. I realize it's not this game, <laughs> but this game set us on that path. I think I'm tired of these cliches, and I count on the creators to vote for me. Thank you. All right, John and Eric, what do you guys think? Well, first I want to say, uh, John, how do we end up choosing a card that's going to leave us on such a positive note regarding the <laughs> <video> games? <laughs> I guess we went for one of the cards we didn't pick was which is more culturally sophisticated. So that might have led to, you know, a, um, uh, a little bit more um, positive ending for games, but probably less funny. So we made the right decision. Now we have to make the big decision. John? I'm afraid we're going to have to go with Jeff. Yes! What? <laughs> Why? I mean, it's obvious, but. Just so everyone knows why. The, the judges appreciated Jeff's historical perspective on the history of video games relating to Gauntlet's influence on the representation of gender in the medium. Wow. I could not have said that I, better. Once you put it that way, I agree. <laughs> so it looks like we have a three-way tie. I think we'll have to split the $100 three-way between all the charities. Adam, what charity were you, were you playing for? Uh, I chose uh, the Innocence Project, uh, which gets uh, like life people off death row with DNA testing. And what about you, Jared? It's a Robin Hood Foundation. It feeds people. And I also chose a food-based one, the Food Bank of New York. They also feed people. 
Uh, so they'll all be getting thirty-three dollars and thirty-three cents. Yeah. And uh, that is the show. Oh man, I don't know if you guys can tell just by listening, but I had an absolute fucking blast on stage that night, and I have a lot of people to thank for it, and they're gonna get thanked right here. First of all, the first thanks goes to everyone that came to the show that night. It was a great crowd, I met a lot of really cool people afterwards. Uh, you know, I explained in the intro that I do the show for myself, but uh, I certainly hope you guys liked it too. Because uh, on stage, we were really enjoying ourselves. And thank you to everyone who was on stage. The contestants, uh, Adam Conover and Jared Logan, both of whom, by the way, are hilarious stand-ups so you should check out, and they're also both on the new Best Week Ever on VH1, so definitely keep an eye out for them. Uh, also want to thank all the judges, of course, Pat Castles, uh, Jackie Cation, who, uh, sh- her show was on right after mine at the, uh, at the venue. Uh, she went, took over the stage after we left, and, uh, her show, The Dork Forest, that night she had, uh, Wyatt Sinak on from The Daily Show. They talked about his dorkiness. Uh, you should definitely check that out on her podcast, The Dork Forest. Uh, also gotta thank the band, Scott Wiener, who pulled double duty as band leader slash second banana for the night. And of course, put together the rest of that amazing band, Mike Lang, Joe Moore, Eric Frieda. Thank you guys so much. Also, got a lot of help behind the scenes on this one. Uh, Justin Willett ran tech. He took pictures, he took video. Those are all gonna be on my website, uh, which believe me, I'm gonna be plugging in a minute. Uh, There's video of the band playing, there's pictures from the whole show, so check that out. Thank you again, Justin. Uh, Thank you to Jess Adji, who uh, produced the show. I don't know what I would have done if she wasn't there that night. It was incredibly generous. Thank you again, Jess, uh, not only for this, but for all the help. You always help with the podcast. Thank you to Matt Asolda, who helps me with post-production every week, but helped a lot on this one. And finally, thank you to Jeremy Wine, who organized the entire New York Podcast Festival. This was the first one. It was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of it. One more time, real quick, I want to remind you about the three charities that we chose because they're three great charities. They're worth hearing about again, and I hope you will consider supporting them. Jared and I both chose uh, hunger-related charities, the Robin Hood Foundation and the Food Bank of New York. Both help put food uh, in the bellies of a lot of people that need it. Adam chose the Innocence Project, which helps pay for DNA testing for people who are on death row, who are on death row, who may very well be innocent. So they're saving a lot of lives that way. Uh, This is a free podcast. I don't ask for a lot. But if you guys could consider supporting those three charities, that would be amazing. Maybe pick the charity of the person you thought knew the most about video games. That's really how we should assign all charitable donations. No new episode of the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show next week. It is the first week of the month, which means I have the week off, but I will be back uh, throughout February with more amazing guests, and you will hear all about it. All about it. When you follow me on Twitter, at Jeff Rubin Show, on my Tumblr, at Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin.com. By the way, that's where the pictures and the video uh, are also probably most easily accessed. Uh, also, Facebook fan page, and YouTube.com slash Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin. This was a really fun one for me. Thank you again, everyone that uh, came to the show, that was on the stage, that was behind the stage. Couldn't have done it without all you people. Thank you. 